Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, for the gift of your church. Where it has gone amiss, bring it back to your will. Where it has acted faithfully, strengthen it. Where it lacks in love, fill it with your spirit. And give us grace to carry on the witness of your church in this age. As we examine and give thanks and explore those who or witness to you in their ages. Amen. Amen. So the uh, last semester, we kind of spread our wings a bit, and we looked at different religions, and we looked at, uh, and the purpose of that was to, in some ways, make sure that is to provide ways to work with other people of faith and understand them and to kind of develop a bit of empathy. And as we were going through that entire class, which I found incredibly powerful because I have a, a, a great deal of, of interest in interfaith relations and understanding and engagement, I just started getting excited about Jesus again. And so I thought, why not focus on the history of the Christian faith? and this actually is a topic that I've had to teach around uh, for the last 15 years, and I'm also drawing from from uh, from uh, Troy Dostert again. What I want to do is to have you see the formation of Christian ideas and Christian teaching as it unfolded as part of a larger culture and institutional framework. Because I think that that's part of the story of Christianity, which is, it's on, right? Can you hear me? Here we know. And, um, I find that that's just a, that's a really important part of what it means to be a Christian, is to see not just the ideas or beliefs about Jesus, but to see how Christianity as a culture developed. And one of the things that Wilkins does well in this book is he begins from the beginning to look at how Christianity formed as a kind of cultural religion. Um, I use the term emergence. Uh, that was that's kind of my term, and, and I, I, those of you who uh, like uh, scientific theory will, will recognize that I've, I've talked about emergence theory. Uh, by that I mean it's a theory that believes that the only way to understand the evolution of something <coughs> is to see how many factors work together to bring it to being. That there isn't just one cause, but there are multiple factors, not just the people who are the actors, but the context, but the, the climate, the place that something is happening. And, and what I like about this, this, this book and the course that we're going to try to do is we're going to try to set the stage for all of that wider kind of cultural look. So I begin with a, a, um, with a definition from the OED of emergence, which is the process of coming forth, issuing from concealment, obscurity, or confinement, 
also said as a result of an evolutionary process. So that's kind of the idea behind this course, that we are trying to look at how these different institutions that we now take for granted were in many ways part of what Christians brought. And, and primarily what it means is that Christianity is not only a system of belief, but a religion that Wilkins says is culture creating. And what does he mean by that? He means that Christians didn't just introduce new ideas about God and Jesus Christ. He means that Christians developed new architecture, produced art, composed music, gave birth to hospitals, and invented canon law by which the society was to be led and organized. One of the neat things that he does that uh, some other historians have done, but he, but Wilkins does this with an incredible uh, uh, acumen, is he, he, he uh, talks about the role that monasteries played in the formation of Christianity in its first thousand years. Uh, one uh, commentator on this book said that he, he rightly gets the fact that monks and monasteries were like cell phones in airports. They seem to be everywhere. You know, there's no way when you walk through us at an airport, you always are seeing people on cell phones, playing with phones, doing games. The same thing happened for Christian culture in the first thousand years. They were everywhere. And secondly, that, that Christianity advanced and spread through the institutions that developed as a result of this culture. Now here is where my view of things is going to be very different from a lot of the putrid theology you've been taught for generations. <laughs> Just in case you wondered whether I had a strong opinion. Yeah. I, I, you have heard this said, and it started in the late 19th century, but not really. I think people misread a theologian by the name of Ernst Trausch, and, and, and primarily that was uh, person who misread him was Richard Niebuhr, a great uh, mind. Uh, there was this belief that Christianity had this, uh, these two main branches. It was Christianity as an institution and Christianity as a sect. And, and you see these two types operating, and there's also a mystical Christianity, but that doesn't concern us today. Uh, you see these two types operating side by side, so that when you have institutions, and inevitably institutions become ossified and fossilized and, and hard, and they're hard to deal with, and you have things like, you know, the Reformation, which is meant to recreate the institution and change it, and that usually happens when you have an inspired leader of a movement, and sex are voluntary associations, so in institutional churches, you have an emphasis on the sacraments. In sex, you have an, you have an emphasis on evangelism. Uh, in institutional churches, you have a kind of vision of the church that is from the gospel parable of the weeds and the wheat, you know, where everybody is part of the church no matter what. And in sex, you have this, this emphasis on personal conversion, and people police themselves to keep from backsliding. And these two types have come to be seen, the, the, have become kind of like the lenses through which to see Christianity. And so, if you ask certain theologians, when did Christianity begin to go wrong? They'll tell you it was when it became an institution, when Constantine uh, uh, recognized Christianity after the a famous battle where he was told to dedicate it to the Son God, that Christianity became corrupted by power and, and, and the lure of gold, and it began to fall to pieces right from the beginning. Now this is a wonderful, interesting theory. It's delightful. It clarifies so much. The only problem with it, it's wrong. It's completely historically illegitimate and wrong. It's something we, we should probably just strike from our minds. If I had the power to do so, I would strike it from our minds, but I don't. I only have you people. So do what you can. <laughs> because we need institutions. That's my normative point, but let me step back. 
Christianity began as a series of institutions that were built. Not just monasteries, but hospitals, schools, all of these things. Art, architecture. And one of the more exciting things about being a Christian is to become part of what T.S. Eliot once called Christian culture. It has its own power, its own vitality. And that's where Wilkins shines a bit as a historian. Now, all of this I'm saying, I realize that Dr. Dostert and Pastor Dostert might have different views of this. They're free to argue otherwise. I did kind of load the dice because I picked the person who's going to defend Christianity as an institution. Um, so I, I, it's my fault. I, it's also it's the rector's forum, so I get to load the dice a bit. But I think it's important because I think much of this theology that you've heard that's anti-institutional has no idea how it's been shaped by institutions. Uh, I've seen this time and time again in the church from at least the 1960s, and I've studied the primary documents. People want to be free of the institution of the church, and so they grab onto things. And, and, and I understand, because institutions do have their shadow side to say the least, right? But, but the very kind of character that reforms an institution is created by that institution. And one of the things that we're learning now that our institutions are in decline is we can't actually do good social change anymore. Because to have social change, you need a body of people who have been disciplined, right? Um, it just doesn't come out of nowhere. And to step back further, and I don't want to bore you with German philosophy, but that whole typology that Trelsch generates is basically from Hegel. And it's this idea that societies have two facets. There is the Gesell shaft of the institutions, which are at the top, and then you have the mind shaft of the community, the, the way we, we, are, we are knit together in our relations. And one Sorry, of the things... I was looking at this. The shell shaft are the institutions. So that's the power base, the structures, the orders within something. And then you have the mind shaft, which, are the, which is the community. I learned this, this, this distinction when I was in high school, because they would pick the senior class leaders carefully and they would tap them. This is what they called it at the school I went to. They would tap the senior leaders. And these senior leaders would function as the institutional power that the headmaster had over the class. And depending on how well that headmaster picked that person, um, that institutional power could be powerful. But most often, the headmaster chose the wrong person. If, if the headmaster really wanted to run the class, he, he would have picked the person. See, there was another hierarchy created by the Gemeinschaft, <laughs> the relational power. And the smart headmaster would be the person who would pick the person who had some relational power and not just institutional power. And so that's where I think uh, Trelsch gets his idea. He doesn't footnote it, but that's because he was German. And Footnoting Hegel would just be, you know, your whole book would be just filled with, you know, marginalia. The, uh, so, Wilkins' idea is that Christianity is built up by institutions. And he sees these operating back and forth with main driving ideas. And one of the things, though, he prefers the term culture. And the reason why he prefers the term culture is because cultures are not solid, hermetically sealed. Cultures are um, often impacted by the next culture to them. 
and they're impacted not so much like, you know, this chair is impacted by my fist. Cultures tend to be permeable, right? They're more like cells, right? Um, they, 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 the, 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 the interaction with another culture affects your own culture, often in ways you don't recognize, often in ways you don't perceive initially. Uh, for better or for worse, it can be a great thing when two cultures come alongside one another. Um, you can find ways to grow and, 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 and to um, uh, develop a more consistent worldview. Of, um, the philosopher Alistair McIntyre believed that cultures are constantly working within each other, and the culture that wins is not the culture that stays true to its, its fundamental beliefs, so much as the culture that's able to accommodate the other culture. That the power of a tradition, says um, McIntyre, is its ability to incorporate other voices, other perspectives. So Christian culture, when it received, again, the writings of Aristotle from the Muslim world in the 13th century, realized uh, almost as one that they had a huge problem on their hands because Aristotle's philosophy was powerful. And so they put their best minds on understanding Aristotle's philosophy. And that's what Thomas Aquinas did in many ways. So cultures are shaped by these engagements. Now Christianity was shaped by, of course, its mother religion, Judaism. And one part of this story is going to talk about that, although that, in the scope of this book, that has a very small part to play. It also was affected by the beliefs of late antiquity around God. And that was, that those beliefs were at once philosophical and um, polytheistic. So much of the debates over the Trinity much of the debates over Christology, or who is Jesus Christ, the person and work of Jesus Christ, much of the understanding of itself as a people, much of its belief in the body and the world around it, all of that was affected by this primary engagement for the first five to 600 years. After 600 years in, Wilkins argues that the main challenge to Christianity the main cultural companion and cultural competitor was Islam. And how Christianity accommodated or failed to accommodate Islam is a key thing to understanding the first thousand years of Christianity. So that's, that's part of what it means to be, um, to be looking at Christianity as a culture, um, as a culture creating religion. And then one final thing that he does that I think is incredibly key in this book is many of the histories of Christianity move westward. But in fact, Christianity from the beginning saw itself as a global religion, right? As a missionary religion. And, and just so you know, that, that is not the most peaceful way to be in the world. <laughs> um, I know that you hear words about mission as if this is a nice thing, <laughs> and most often it is, or it's actually spoken by nice people, but, but mission is, uh, by its nature, expansionist. What are the three great mission religions of the world? Christianity is one. Islam. 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 What's the third? Buddhism. Buddhism. Oh, see, we did this. Alright, never mind. You guys <laughs> now, when I teach that in Tennessee, they're always like, <laughs> Buddhism! Buddhism! Yeah. Alright, I'll just not I'll strike that from the video record. <laughs> so, so, uh, but, but, but that kind of movement 
was as much to the east as it was to the west. The problem with the eastern with Eastern Christianity is that it never achieved a culturally dominant status. So you have the Church of Martoma in India, you have other places um, uh, where Christianity uh, in Turkey, where Christianity lost to Islam. Um, but that didn't mean that Christianity didn't exist in one form or another. And that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist today. Any questions before I jump into today's thing? All right, we're all excited. <laughs> so, yes. Yes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was counting on you. Do you have a clear definition of what Christianity is? I mean, is Christianity that embraces uh, multiple lives for Christianity. I think, I, you know, I, so this is a class in history, right? So it is a class in history taught by someone who believes in Jesus, right? So I do have very strong beliefs about what it means to believe in Jesus. But for the purpose of this class, I'm going to speak in the most expansive way possible. Um, I think Dharma McCullough Actually, even though he wrote a 3,000-page book that I can't have you guys read, because it's beautiful, but my God, 3,000 pages. Um, he defines Christianity. Maybe next year. No. <laughs> he just be shouting across an empty hall. Um, but I'll be excited. Um, he defines Christianity as a personality cult around Jesus. And that's how he sees it operating at the very beginning. Of things. It was a personality cult around Jesus. Now, what did he mean by he's being he's being provocative, right? But he's saying this is a cultus. Uh, uh, rituals were based that were influenced by a central figure, and that figure uh, was a person, not not a, not a, 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 a not a, just a shadowy figure, not a god, not a not a god from elsewhere that is unlike us. So Jesus didn't have blue skin, right? Um, it, was, it was a person who was flesh and blood, and yet God and man, and that was a person, and that's who we worship. And that's what it means to be a Christian. And that's what McCullough's incredibly expansive view of what it means to be a Christian. And I, I think we can, we, can, we can see that as maybe the starting point and see how this shapes. Go ahead. I was just going to say, when I, when I um, you know, pray the Nicene Creed, as we all will, uh, you know, in church, that's probably very limited on my part, but that is my definition of Christianity. That, right. is, that is what I buy into. And, you know? and that, came to, that came to being in 383 uh, in, 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 in Constantinople. So already you have three, almost 400 years of, well, maybe a little less than 400 years of Christian thought happens before that. Right. About 50 years ago, the Episcopal Church put on a series that they called Via Media. And one of their statements reads over and over is, Jesus commanded us to do what he told us to do, not to worship him. Yeah. Does that mean if we do what Jesus commanded us, as opposed to worship him, we are not Christian? I'll get to that today, uh, because I think that there's a, there's a difference there that is subtle, and it really doesn't give way to slogans. Um, but I do believe we should worship Jesus. I think I, if that's the case, I have to say the Via Media is not, is not uh, that, 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 that version of the Via Media was wrong. <laughs> Eric. Barry's, I, I'm grateful, Barry, to, for making that point. Uh, at the same time, it's worth noticing that A, Jesus tells people to do what he tells them to do. B, in the New Testament records, when the early community worship him and call him Lord and God, he doesn't tell them not to. Yes. You know, and this is what we're going to get to. Let me jump in. Because we're going to have to move quickly now that I have 15 minutes. We <laughs> you might fall behind. <laughs> This is the first day. It's good. 
I'm so thrilled you all are here. Okay, so one of the things that Wilkins does when he says beginning in Jerusalem is you'll find in the book that he actually moves in a different direction than you expect because he says we're going to begin in Jerusalem and he starts to talk about Rome, Imperial Rome. Now, why does he do that if he says beginning in Jerusalem? Well, because according to the whole approach that he has, he wants to show how Imperial Rome had a kind of template for what it meant to be uh, a, a, um, an empire, a collective, a, a major political a collective. And so you had the emperor, who, uh, the first emperor, uh, 27 BC, Octavian, who became known as Caesar Augustus. You had uh, a metropole. So keep in mind that, that this whole idea of like borders, territories, that's a fairly recent invention by, by mostly European states, or um, well, quasi-European states, depending on what you want to call Russia, um, you know, a, a, in the 19th century. So this idea of actual territories being policed and borders being policed were, were much less um, a, a thing of, 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 the, of antiquity. In those days, you had primarily, you had a metropole, which was your capital city, and you had dominion states. You had, you had uh, nations that you had conquered. And the reason why this is important is that they were held together by a lingua franca, which was Greek. I love that. Um, just a little yeah. joke. Lingua, never mind. Yeah, okay. um, and the infrastructure enabled the spread of ideas, goods, and technology. And then finally, you, you had this kind of ways of, of seeing one self as part of a single competent community. Which means that despite some regional, racial, ethnic, and cultural differences which were encouraged by the Romans, there still were these unifying beliefs and they, that were inscribed in people through institutions and through incredible architecture and art, which meant that they were part of a single being. Now, Operating in the background of this, whether or not Wilkins is acknowledging it or not, or knows it or not, is, I think, a signal book by an anthropologist of sorts called Benedict Anderson. And Anderson developed this incredible book called Imagined Communities. And Anderson said that communities are um, acts of the imagination. States are acts of the imagination. And, and in the older version of political uh, social imaginaries, as, as they came to be known, uh, as that term came to be known, you had this idea of an emperor, a single unifying person who embodied the whole, the political whole. So you had this single person embodying the collective body, right? You had this idea of a metropole more than you had an idea of a uh, of a territory, right? And then you had this sense of being and belonging that uh, created a sense of what it meant to be a Roman citizen. Remember <coughs> Paul, when he is being persecuted at one point in the New Testament, he, can, he gets them to stop beating him up when he says, I'm a Roman citizen. They all went, uh-oh. Human resources is going to hear about this. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, that's the, that's the whole idea. Now think about that as a cultural, as, a, as, a, as an intellectual, as a kind of ideational template for what it means to be in a political collective. Because Jerusalem, at Jesus' day, and the early Christians who operated within Imperial Rome, or the Greco-Roman Empire, they saw themselves in that political world. And so when they begin to imagine Christianity, it's going to have some of the contours of the context they were in. So you had Jerusalem, which was in some sense a fallen metropole. Jerusalem was the spiritual and political center of Israel. But Israel had uh, gone through several uh, um, generations and, and, and hundreds of years of being conquered and reconquered. And so Jerusalem 
was the last bit of, a, uh, of the metropole. It's as if the empire collapsed in on itself. Make it smaller. The temple is all that's left. The temple is really all that's left. And the temple still is uh, a site of not just theological but political power, right? Because that's where you have, even that's just being policed back and forth, that's where you have um, uh, the, the, the high priests go to, to Pilate and all the kinds of things that are being enacted in Jesus' time. Um, and also keep in mind, this is why in the book of Acts, where did the disciples go to proclaim the resurrection? But in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the, the center of their universe. Their universe was uh, under dominion. They were in captivity. But that was, that was part of what they saw. So they had a spiritual metropole, the temple, as I say on page three. And then you had a kind of different um, view. So in the temple, you had one kind of style of worship. You had daily sacrifice. You had a place of pilgrimage, of seasonal celebration. And then you have in the towns and villages, you have kind of the, the, the people who express their dominion or their allegiance to that metropole through reading the Torah, uh, the prophets, expositions and interpretations of them, singing songs, reciting prayers in modest rectangular buildings called synagogues. And then, although once an independent kingdom, Israel had been conquered repeatedly, and in Jesus' time was under Roman dominion, <laughs> domination, starting in the first century BC. So that, that is the kind of, in a very brief, very sweeping uh, idea, uh, uh, that, is the, that is the theopolitical context in which Christianity emerges. So then Wilkins goes on to, this, to describe the emergence of Jesus. And his view um, is quite interesting because he is a historian, and so he doesn't go into the gospel accounts of Jesus' miraculous birth, but he goes right to the point where, oh, by the way, Wilkins was Lutheran and he converted to being Roman Catholic. So don't, even though he's going to tell this story differently, he only has about four pages for Jesus. So. Recognize he probably would have more. He only wrote four pages on Jesus. In this entire book? On Jesus' own earthly ministry. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, Jesus is... The rest is aftershock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you'll see, you'll see, you'll see. I'm so excited you're following. Yeah. <laughs> but his, his depiction of Jesus is quite powerful, and in many ways it's shaped by the way he set up this idea um, the metropole, the kingdom, the empire, the emperor, right? So Jesus comes in to historical view when he's nearly 30 years old, and when uh, he does come into view, he comes into view as a disciple of John the Baptist. He gets baptized by John the Baptist. And then um, uh, Jesus carries on through his disciples a ministry of baptism, of, uh, for repentance. But more importantly than baptism, Jesus, uh, Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God. And so you see in Mark um, the following words. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God, saying the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come. Repent and believe in the good news. And, uh, and, and the kingdom of God for Wilkins, although laden with political meaning, Jesus deployed it in ways that were largely unpolitical. God would act soon in new and surprising ways to save his people, right wrongs, deliver judgment, and inaugurate a new age. All of this was what political leaders did, right? But Jesus uh, saw God working in a way that saw that the kingdom of God was present in his person, as a kind of already but not yet. Benicia. So I find that statement incredibly confusing. Um, at its best and incredibly misleading at its worst. So, um, so my question is, if Wilkins believes that, that culture is affected by Christianity, why is he making a delineation between culture and the political realm first? Yeah. And second, how does he get to say that even though Jesus had political meaning, he was largely unpolitical? What is he divine, defining as political? Good questions. What he's trying to say, and I think it can be said better, 
Um, and this is the person who I'm going to draw from to answer this is Christopher Bryan, who's a New Testament scholar who has written a couple of books to, um, again, to challenge kind of a dominant read by a person named Horsley, right? He argues, uh, and I think this is what I think Wilkins is trying to say, is that Jesus doesn't spend a lot of time on political structures. He actually finds discussing political structures often beside the point. His politics is broader and more powerful and more of an imaginatory thing. This is why I think there's some elegance in what Wilkins is saying, because, because at the end of the day, the political structures of Christianity prove to be somewhat pragmatic, right? In the, in, in the ultimate sense, people are willing to work with different political structures. They didn't come out saying, monarchy is bad, or the emperor can't be worked with. Um, but that doesn't mean there's no political relevance of the kingdom of, kingdom of God, which is what I think you're getting at. And so by that, that's what I think he's getting at. And I think on that, I think, I, I, I know that subsequent generations of scholars will see, like when Jesus is confronting um, the demoniac uh, in one of the Gospels, I think it's Mark, and the, and the demoniac says, uh, the demon speaking through the man, say, we are legion, right? Obviously, that's a politically powerful term, to say we are legion is to call to mind Roman domination through the legions, right? So, so Jesus is clearing the ground, literally, spiritually, when he gets rid of the legions of Satan, right? So, but, but, but that's, that's not meant to say that Jesus was going to try to overtake uh, a, a Roman outpost, right? So he wasn't concerned with that. So the kingdom of God... Uh, so one of the things you can see, and this is an example that Wilkins does, and it comes from today's gospel, which is to look at how Jesus interprets Isaiah 61, 1 to 2, and Luke 4, 16 to 21. And here I'm going to, 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 to 5, uh, page 5. When he came to Nazareth, where he was brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And then he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Right? So it's at that point, this, this passage from Isaiah was given towards the end of Isaiah when it was a hopeful language about the, the coming, the return to Israel, to the promised land, to home. It was given... Uh, I think it's powerfully, uh, uh, it's a powerful political language, right? Be, from now on, we will always have a political element to this. The, the measure of a society will always be how it treats its poor, how it treats its prisoners, how it handles dissent, and how it handles uh, difference, and whether or not it oppresses them. Winston Churchill, as I'm about to say my sermon, said that the best measure of society is how it treats its prisoners. If you want to know what level of civilization they have, look at how they treat their prisoners. Right? That, that's political. But when Jesus takes those words from Isaiah, he makes those politics present in himself. He makes the kingdom present in himself. And that's, that creates some of the tensions, the creative tensions, like the way a bridge is held through creative tension, through which the culture of Christianity begins to be made. Now, I'll finish with something that we have to finish, but I'll come back next week to finish this lecture. Um, keep in mind that you have, um, in the Gospels, the faith of Christ is most present. It's not until you get to the epistles 
that you get the Christ of faith. Right? By that I mean, in the Gospels, you are watching Jesus, a believing Jew, believe fully in what God is calling him to be. In the epistles, that story is viewed from another perspective as the Christ of faith that we have come to believe in. Go ahead. With this one odd observation. Yeah. The epistles were written before the Gospels. Fair enough, yes. Historically, they were. But but realize that people, and as we get into things, people did not always place uh, a lot of, of stock in written documents. And what, and interestingly enough, this has been proven by anthropologists, oral tradition varies less than written traditions. <laughs> really. Because when you remember it, and your job is to remember it, it actually doesn't change as much as written redactions and things like that. I know this is crazy, but they were very suspicious of writing down the stories about Jesus. Those were really questions. Paul, Paul would, you know, write a letter because he was pissed off. The, um, <laughs> no, geez, I'm <laughs> you foolish Galatians, we gotta stop. All right, come back next week. We'll start again.